Hello, this is uh, Cliff Drubin, Associate Technical Editor at Microwave Journal. I'd like you to welcome you today to today's webinar discussing high-performance PCB laminates and modeling for microwave and millimeter wave applications, presented by Jian Mun of Comsol and John Coonrod of Rogers. Before we begin the presentation, let me cover a few logistical items. In the center of your screen, you'll see a window containing the slides. You may enlarge this to full screen to have a better view of the presentation. The window labeled Resource List, which you can access from the green box at the bottom of your screen, contains a copy of the presentation to download. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to replay about an hour after we finish. So you can watch it again and suggest it to, to your colleagues who weren't available to join this live event. You'll find a link to the recording in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. We, have, we will have uh, time for some Q&A after the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, type it in the Q&A box on your screen during the webinar. If you have any technical problems, you may click in the yellow box with the question mark at the bottom of your screen, which will take you to a user's guide. Or just submit a question in the Q&A box and we'll try to help you. That's it for the instructions. Now let me introduce our speakers. Jun Mun is the technical product manager for RF modules at Comsol. He has worked in the RF industry for two decades, creating more than 150 antenna and microwave device prototypes and holds patents for antenna inter interrogation systems. He has a master's uh, degree in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan and is a senior member of the IEEE. John Coonrod is the technical marketing manager for the advanced connectivity solutions segment at Rogers with 30 years experience in the printed circuit board industry. Most recently doing electrical characterization applications uh, in support of high frequency circuit materials. John chairs the IPC D24C high frequency test, met test methods task group and he has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Arizona State University. Uh, at this point, Yoon, I'll turn the screen over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ji Yoon. I'd like to welcome you all. In this first part of the webinar, you will see a live demonstration in the console multi-fix software showing how to set up and run a simulation of a grounded CPW circuit. We will investigate the impact of a surface roughness model on the performance of the circuit board. Before the live demo, I'm going to give a brief introduction about the simulation software. Compared to traditional electromagnetic modeling, you can extend your model to include effects such as temperature rise, structural deformation, and fluid flow using console multi-physics. Multiple physical effects can be coupled together and consequently affect all included physics during the simulation of an electromagnetic device. The RF module, an add-on to the console multi-physics software, enables you to combine electromagnetics with any other type of physics. You can see and change all of the physics features in the same modeling environment. COMSOL is a simulation platform that encompasses all of the steps in the modeling workflow, from defining geometries, material properties, and the physics that describe static phenomena to solving and post-processing models for producing accurate and trustworthy results. In the RF module, high frequency electromagnetic phenomena are addressed through several physics interfaces combined with the different types of study steps. The RF module is used by design engineers of microwave and millimeter wave devices to model antennas, waveguides, filters, planar circuits, cavities, metamaterials, and frequency selective surfaces, and also analyze scattering problems. By simulating electromagnetic wave propagation and resonant behavior, it is possible to compute electromagnetic field distribution 
transmission, reflection, impedance, Q factors as parameters for field radiation pattern and power dissipation. The EM modeling is not limited to the frequency domain, but also feasible in the time domain. The electromagnetic waves transient physical interface is well suited for studying nonlinear electromagnetic wave behaviors, time domain reflectometry, and special types of constitutive relation, such as the drude lorentz dispersion model. The equations in all models developed in console multi-physics can be completely coupled such that the electromagnetic fields can both affect and be affected by any other physics. The dedicated user interface for microwave and millimeter wave heating expands simulation capabilities beyond traditional power deposition analysis. By solving for maximum equation in the frequency domain and the heat transfer equation in the stationary or time domain, it is possible to compute the rising temperature over time and the effects of varying material properties with the temperature change. Modeling electromagnetics problem calls for expensive options for boundary conditions and geometric settings. Therefore, you will find the preset geometry capabilities in the RF module, whether you are working in a 1D, 2D, or 3D domain. Choose from a wide variety of detailed boundary conditions to describe metallic boundaries, including impedance boundaries and perfect electric and magnetic conductors, and radiating or absorbing boundaries such as scattering boundaries and perfectly matched layers. To reduce model size, the RF module also supports periodic boundary conditions. The variety of boundary conditions covers a wide range of design scenarios, allowing you to model the geometry of ports, cables, devices, and other components and complex geometries. Metals are materials that are highly conductive and reflect or guide an instant electromagnetic wave very well. When using the RF module to simulate electromagnetics problem in the frequency domain, there are several options for modeling metallic objects. You will get an overview of the transition boundary condition for modeling thin, lossy conductive surfaces during the live demo. There are asymptotic waveform evaluation, AWE, and frequency domain model methods. Both are designed to help you overcome the conventional issue of a longer simulation time. When using a very fine frequency resolution or running a very wide band simulation, the AWE or adaptive frequency sweep is quite efficient when it comes to describing smooth frequency responses with a single resonance or no resonance at all. The frequency domain model method, meanwhile, is useful for quickly analyzing multi-stage filters or filters of a high number of elements that have multiple resonances in a target pattern. One of the advantages using console multi-physics is that you can make orders of magnitude faster simulation when modeling axisymmetric structures, although it's possible to set up and solve a 3D model of a conical core antenna. Such a model would require a relatively large amount of computational resources to solve. We can solve for the electromagnetic field much more quickly by exploiting the symmetry of the structure. Say you are simulating a device and want to get a very wide band frequency response with a small frequency step in the 
frequency domain or the time domain reflecting a tree with a long time period. This will take a long time. However, in both cases, the computation performance in a wide range of frequencies and time can be boosted by running the simulation in the complementary domain first and then conducting an FFT to generate the result in the preferred domain. For example, you can simulate the transient analysis and then run a time to frequency FFT for a wide band frequency response. Or you can perform a frequency sweep and then run a frequency to time FFT for a time domain band path impulse response. Console is a multi physics as well as a single physics simulation platform. It covers mechanical, fluid, electrical, and chemical simulations, or really any physics that you can think of. Console is well known for multi physics or coupled phenomena, and by this, I mean two or more physics phenomena that affect each other without the limitation to the number of physics that can be included in a model. The following live demo will address a basic coplanar waveguide, CPW circuit. I will show you how to apply lossy boundary condition with a well-known surface roughness model that will be customized with measurement data. It would take a few seconds to switch the screen. Now, let's explore the console desktop. We have a slick, simple to use interface where all the modeling steps are recorded and can be edited later on if needed. This actually happens in the window referred to as the model builder. We input or select our custom settings in the window just next to the model builder and then visualize the result in the graphics window. The horizontal menu on top contains the most important options so you don't have to remember where that particular boundary condition is. Or just right click on the physics you're working with and all the relevant options will be presented to you in a context menu. Let's start by building the geometry of the ground CPW circuit. Since it would take longer than the given amount of time for the webinar, I loaded a finished model. We can still see the steps to build each part and finalize the geometry. First, add a block for the circuit board. And add a work plane and draw a rectangle. And this is for the CPW slot. Add another rectangle for the center conductor and add a tapered line to make smooth transition from the coaxial pin to the CPW. Mirror it to make a pair. And you can union the center conductor to get rid of the interior boundaries. Well, this is optional. In the second work plane, we add a pattern for the bias. First, draw a circle and make an array by extruding the array. Now you can see a bunch of cylinders representing metallized via structure. 
You can see the interior by clicking either transparency button or wireframe rendering button. Add a block for the air domain. Some boundaries can be removed from the view. While measuring the F parameters of a circuit using a network analyzer in a laboratory, calibration is performed to extract the pure circuit response. However, calibration usually considers the cable end-to-end -to, -end to measure the circuit with the connectors while the simulation model often excludes the connectors to keep the computation simple and fast. For this model, in order to accurately describe the lab measurements, the simulation model includes connectors. It would be cumbersome to build that type of geometry every time you want to model a multi-port device. If there is a predefined geometry, popularly used, we would easily overcome this barrier. The RF module includes the part library consisting of a number of standard parts and geometries. Each part has controllable parameters, so you can change geometry configuration and predefined the selections which can be used and to update the physical settings, material properties, solver settings, and post-processing operations. Some of the geometries frequently used in the RF modeling include various types of connectors, surface mount device footprints, and rectangular waveguides. For this CPW circuit, I use the edge launch connector from signal microwave. Duplicate it on the other side. Now, it is all set for the geometry. The RF module features the material library with the properties for more than 60 substrate materials from the Rogers Corporation. To assist in modeling microwave and millimeter wave circuit boards, The entire domain is set to the air. Then the dielectric part of connector is defined with nephilim. Rogers RO4835 laminate is used for the CPW circuit board. Regarding the physical settings, the volume of the connectors is not part of the simulation, where we do not expect any wave propagation inside. The material properties of the circuit board and coaxial dielectric are configured with a dielectric constant and loss tangent, so it is necessary to choose the right constitutive relation. Log ports are used to excite and terminate the end of connectors. 
scattering boundary condition is an absorbing boundary condition that is added on the exterior boundaries of the air box. So any radiation from the circuit board will be absorbed and won't be reflected back. Transition boundary condition is appropriate for a layer of conductive material with a thickness relatively smaller than the object being modeled. The transition boundary condition can be used even if the thickness is many times greater than the skin depth. It takes the material properties as well as the thickness of the thin layer as input. Computing an impedance through the thickness of the thin layer as well as the tangential impedance. These are used to relate the current flowing on the surface of either side of the thin layer. All real surfaces, however, have some roughness, which may be significant. Imperfection in the surface prevent the current from flowing tangentially and effectively reduce the conductivity of the surface. This effect can be accounted for with the surface roughness sub-feature. That can be added to the impedance boundary condition or transition boundary condition. The transition boundary condition, um, this surface roughness sub-feature, the input is given in terms of root mean square of the thickness of variation of the thin layer. There are two surface roughness models implemented. One is Sawtooth model, Hammerstadt and Jensen model. The other is known as Snowball model. The initial mesh is configured with the physics controlled mesh by default. This gives you the maximum mesh, mesh size, point lambda, and it is also scaled by material properties. When using constant multi-physics, you, you have a full control setting up the mesh. Here, I'm going to apply a final mesh in the CPW slot. The mesh is being updated now. Yeah, can you see the difference? The circuit is analyzed using frequency domain study step where the start frequency is 10 gigahertz and start frequency is 65 gigahertz with the 5 gigahertz step. Total 12 frequency points are included. It takes about five minutes with my desktop computer, so I won't run the simulation, but show you the solution already solved. After simulation, by default, you will get a multi slice plot of electric field norm, 1D plot of the F parameters, and Smith plot. In this model, I added two source plots manually. When you see the loss per unit length, the result of the conventional Solfus model is known to deviate from the real measurement in the millimeter wave range. The simulation also show the similar behavior. There are two sets of measurement data provided by Rogers Corp. One is imported into a table with many frequency points. 
The other is much coarser. as a function of frequency. So I utilize an interpolation function based on the cubic spline. So by the way, the unit is dB per inch. To get over the limit of the traditional surface roughness model, we can change the original equation. When using COMSOL multi-physics, you can access and change the variables and equations used in the simulation through equation view. So, go to surface roughness equation view, and you will see the scaling factor, and you can modify the equation. For example, if you have the surface area index, and you can just type it easily. specify what's your surface area index. In my case, I updated the equation with the frequency input argument to make a curve fitting model to the obtained empirical data. So I ran the simulation again. After another five minutes of computation, I have a new result. The modified Hammerstedt and Jensen model. Good agreement is observed up to 65 gigahertz. So far, I've shown you the workflow, uh, the modeling the CPW using the RF module. Although simulating RF devices is a straightforward process, it is a good idea to start with a simple structure, whether you are a beginner or an expert. In this way, you can ensure that the basic modeling process is correct before adding any complex simulation features. To capture the details of the physics, such as the loss on metallic surfaces, the default perfect electric conductor boundary condition can be replaced by the transition boundary condition for a geometrically very thin loss layer or an impedance boundary condition for surfaces of lossy volume. Lump ports and electrical waveguide ports, as well as numeric ports to terminate the line with arbitrary impedance are also available. After setting up these features, you should be able to design your complicated models that is closer to the real world devices. On our website, you will find the helpful information about multi physics and the latest news about our product. You will also find the, an application gallery, video tutorials, console blog, and discussion forum. If you are looking to update your current version of a console multi-fisc software or try out for the first time, go to console.com and under the section called Support, select the product download or update. If you'd like to speak with us directly, just contact us at console.com slash contact. The next part of the webinar is an overview of the Rogers PCB materials to overcome the effects of conductor surface roughness. When high frequency is 
needed for 5G devices. The surface roughness of the conductive layer may not be negligible. So, I'm quite curious what kind of circuit board materials Rogers Corporation provide in the application area of 5G, IoT, automotive radars, and satellite communication. Hey, John, are you ready to show your cool presentation now? Yes, sir. Thank you, June. I appreciate it. And um, I'm going to be talking more specifically about uh, copper surface roughness and a term that we use called design BK. And uh, to begin with, um, I'm just going to talk about, give me a second, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue where I'm trying to select the slides that I want. Uh, so to begin with, I'm actually going to talk about the copper surface roughness, and in regards to the roughness, it's more specific to uh, the surface roughness as we make the laminate. So it's really the interface between the substrate and the copper itself. So that interface is actually uh, what I'm going to be talking about for copper surface roughness. Hmm. I do not see my slides, actually, um, so give me a second. I might need some technical assistance. I can move the slides for you. Well, okay, would you please? Sure. So, um, yeah, I can't see my slides, so I'm going to have to go by somewhat memory. But uh, so my first slide is just showing the, the big title, Copper Surface Roughness and Design DK. Second slide is going to show you in the upper right-hand corner a microsection view of a um, microstrip circuit showing kind of exaggerated the copper surface roughness example that I'm talking about. And uh, really what happens is the copper surface roughness comes into play uh, due to skin depth and frequencies. So what happens is when you're at a lower frequency and the skin depth is pretty thick, uh, the copper surface roughness has less impact. But once you go up a higher frequency, and of course the skin depth gets thinner, then uh, once you get to the point where the skin depth is equal to the copper surface roughness dimensionally, then that's the point where the copper surface roughness can impact insertion loss, and more specifically, a component of insertion loss called conductor loss. And then also can actually in, uh, impact the phase propagation and the phase velocity. So the table of information I'm showing here are actually two tables. Um, on the right is copper surface roughness, typical of some of the coppers used in the industry. On the left is uh, skin depth and copper. And this is an example, if you're using a circuit that has a high profile ED copper on the bottom right table, roughness about 2.2 microns RMS. And if you're operating around 500 megahertz or 0.5 gigahertz, then the skin depth table on the left says you're probably okay for skin depth and the copper surface roughness not playing a significant role. Uh, however, if you go up to 5 gigahertz, and you can see the skin depth is much thinner than what the copper surface roughness is as measured in RMS. And uh, at that point, then the copper surface roughness will impact the conductor loss, ultimately the insertion loss, and also the phase velocity. And you can kind of look at these numbers on the copper surface roughness and see why rolled copper, uh, being the smoothest, is typically used when you get into the millimeter wave range of frequencies. So the next slide is a very simple slide just showing uh, electromagnetic wave propagation in free space and in another medium. And of course, I think everyone already knows this, but basically if you have a electromagnetic wave propagating in free space, then um, let's say it's assuming, assuming it's the speed of light. Once it encounters another medium that has a higher dielectric constant, the wave basically compresses and you get a shorter wavelength and also it will slow down. And for this slide and the next few slides, I want to talk about the uh, slower wave relating to higher DK. So basically, a higher dielectric constant relates to a slower wave and vice versa. So we know that the dielectric constant of our substrate, when it's a higher dielectric constant, it will slow the wave down. However, on the next slide, um, it's showing the copper surface roughness. I've got two pictures here, actually three pictures and two pictures showing a cross-sectional view zoomed in close at the copper substrate interface. And uh, really what we found was that the copper surface roughness can slow the wave too, regardless of the dielectric constant of the material. 
And uh, what we find is if you build the same circuit that is on the exact same substrate, and the only difference is smooth copper and rough copper, and then you test it, what you'll find is you will have a slower wave propagating on the circuit with the rougher copper. So we know the rough copper does slow the wave down. And again, just from the basic uh, physics of electromagnetics and wave properties, a slower wave is going to be perceived by the circuit as a higher dielectric constant. And on the next slide, I'm showing a chart where we did uh, some examples, or I'm sorry, we did some different circuit evaluations. And we used the same substrate for all these circuit evaluations. Actually, it was the same water material, same everything, and it was 4 mil thick LCP material. And this particular material is isotropic, and also it has very good uh, consistent performance for dielectric constant across a wide range of frequencies, and that's why we chose the material. But what we did before we made the laminate is we chose four different copper types that had significantly different roughness, and we measured the surface roughness of the copper before we made the laminate using the laser profilometer, or more accurately, we used a white light interferometer. And uh, so we got to know what the surface roughness was of each one of these copper foils before we made the laminate. Then we laminated, made the laminate, sent the laminates off to have circuits made. They came back. We tested the circuits. They are 50 ohm microstrip transmission line. And what we did was a simple test method that is the microstrip differential phase length method. And I'll show more details on that test method later, but basically you have two circuits that are identical in every way except physical length. And from that, you can measure phase uh, angle, and from that, get the effective dielectric constant, which is what's reported here on the y-axis of this chart. X-axis is frequency. And you can see there's very distinct trends here. The red curve are the circuits that were built on the laminate with the smoothest copper, having a surface roughness of 0.5 microns RMS. Green curve are circuits built on the same material again, but with a more rough copper. So that's about 0.7 microns RMS. Purple curve is a little rougher copper, and blue curve is circuits built on uh, the laminate with the roughest copper, about 3.0 microns RMS. So keeping in mind that the substrate is no different, it's all the same substrate, the only difference in this chart really is copper surface roughness, and it's showing that a smooth copper red curve is not affecting the phase velocity, and the blue curve circuits using rough copper is slowing the phase velocity and causing the circuit to report a higher dielectric constant, again, even though the substrate itself is not different in dielectric constant. So uh, next slide. I'm going to talk about a term called design decay, and basically what that is is a term we uh, coined some time ago, and that has to do with uh, what I would really call circuit perceived dielectric constant. And as we know, the copper surface roughness does have an impact on how the circuit will perceive the dielectric constant. And I did an example, and I found uh, that, I'm sorry, I did an experiment, actually several experiments, and I found that the copper surface roughness and how it impacts the design decay or the circuit perceived decay, that copper surface roughness and that effect is actually thickness dependent, thickness of the substrate. So what I did was build uh, laminates that were exactly the same materials, same loft of material, try to keep everything consistent as much as possible, and the only difference being thickness. So I built a relatively thin laminate and a thick laminate of the same materials, same copper type, same lots of copper, same lots of the substrate, Built these laminates, sent them off, had the circuit fabricator build microstrip transmission lines for us, came back, I tested them for uh, the design decay. And what I found was the thinner laminate had an average design decay of 3.96, and the thicker laminate had a design decay of 3.68. So using the exact same materials and using the same test methods, I see a pretty significant difference in design decay and a thinner laminate is basically more sensitive to the copper surface roughness than a thicker laminate. And another thought that uh, came from this was the uh, substrate thickness. If you keep going thicker and thicker, you will get to a point where uh, the dielectric, the design dielectric constant does not change. And what happens is when the copper planes are far enough apart, the surface roughness of the copper does not impact the wave velocity anymore and now you're reporting really the design decay of the bulk uh, material itself, the intrinsic decay of the material. So in this case, I'm showing a 30 mil 4350B laminate having a design decay of 3.68. However, if I made that 90 mil thick, uh, or let's say 60 mil thick, 
it'd be about 3.66 if I make it 90 mils thick. And the design decay would be 3.66. 120 mils thick, 3.66. So uh, basically the bottom line is when the copper planes are far apart in the case of a thick substrate, you do not see the effects of the copper surface roughness, and you're really measuring the uh, intrinsic decay of the material itself. So the next slide is showing a chart of uh, three different curves, green curve, blue, and red, and there are, are circuits that were fabricated on the exact same material. It's all using the RL3003 materials and half ounce ED copper. And in this case, the y-axis is the extracted decay, not the effective decay. And again, I'll show you that test method in a few more slides, but basically, once we have the effective decay due to circuit geometry of the circuits being tested, we can extract the decay of the material in regards to frequency. So what I'm showing here is the green curve has the highest design decay trend, and that is using the 5 mil, a relatively thick laminate, I'm sorry, thin laminate. And then the blue curve is a little bit thicker. That's 10 mil thick. Red curve is thicker, again, 20 mil thick. And if I did use something thicker, like 50 or 60 mil thick, you would get a curve that would be hovering right around 3.0, because 3.0 is the intrinsic dielectric constant of the RL3003 materials. Now, the next slide is actually showing uh, something similar, where we built circuits on the same thickness of 5 mil 3003, except that we use rolled copper and ED copper. Again, rolled copper is really smooth. Usually has a surface roughness of about 0.3 or 0.35 microns RMS. And being that it's so smooth, it really does not impact the uh, phase velocity much. It does a little bit. So you can see that the orange curve, the 5 mil 3003 circuits with the rolled copper, you can see it's pretty close to the intrinsic dielectric constant of the material 3.0, and that's because the rolled copper has a minimal effect on the phase velocity. However, with circuits built on the same substrate but rougher copper, the blue curve ED copper, you can see that the ED copper slows the wave and the circuit will perceive a higher dielectric constant, or in this case, what we call a design decay. So just for reference, uh, this material, the 5 mil 3003, uh, that's the dominant material used right now in 77 gigahertz automotive radar applications. And at 77 gigahertz, for materials using uh, 5 mil 3003 with ED copper, we usually get a design decay on average about 3.16, even though this curve is a little bit higher. But the average curves that we see is about 3.16, and rolled copper, we usually see about 3.03. So you can see there's a pretty significant difference in the design decay just due to the copper surface roughness. So the next slide I want to talk about is um, dispersion. And really, this is a frequency component of design decay. And I think most of the RF engineers are familiar with dispersion in the sense of transmission line dispersion, where a microstrip is more dispersive than, let's say, strip line. But this is dispersion in the sense of material, and the material does have dispersion. All materials have dispersion. And what that basically means is the dielectric constant of the material will change with the change in frequency. And for most of the high-frequency materials, it has a slight negative slope where when you increase the frequency, you will have a slight decrease in the dielectric constant. And this dispersion property is uh, really individual or unique to the material formulation itself. And just in a very basic sense, the dispersion will vary due to the formulation or the components of the material, and normally has to do with how polar the material is or how uh, lossy the material is. And continuing on the next slide, um, talking about electric fields, when they are applied to a dielectric material, dipole moments are established. And these dipole moments actually augment the electric flux, which obviously has a relationship to the dielectric constant. But what happens is when these electric fields are turned on and off, the dipole moments are established and then relax and established and relax. And as you turn these fields on and off faster and faster, they get to the point where they do not fully relax. And uh, in that case, what happens is usually in the range of frequencies we're interested in, you get uh, some effect on the electric flux. And uh, that actually is frequency dependent where these relaxation uh, di dipole moment relaxation actually does change with the change in frequency. And just as a quick uh, couple of comments on the dipoles, the dipole displacement actually contributes to the DK or the real value of the complex relative permittivity. And then the molecular friction due to these dipoles rotating, that actually contributes to the dissipation factor. 
Now, if you move on to the next slide, I'm showing a chart that's been shown a lot in the industry, and that is actually right out of a material science text. And it's really showing uh, a dielectric constant behavior across a wide range of frequencies. And uh, this is actually showing a generic material. And, and what I mean by that is high frequency materials will have the same trend, except that uh, the slope really is going to be much more gentle once you get in the range where the dipole, mo dipole moments relaxation are occurring. So at lower frequencies, the, di the design decay is um, actually a constant. And um, it's really not um, varying with frequency. The design decay is actually a constant at this point. So at low frequencies, as you change frequency, the decay itself um, does not change. But once you get up at a higher frequencies, uh, the decay will change. And this happens probably in the low megahertz range. And um, so someplace in the low megahertz range going on up to 1 or 2 or 10 gigahertz, you start getting this knee uh, where you get a, a nonlinear response with frequency. And um, anyway, in the range of frequencies that we're normally operating in, somewhere around a few megahertz up to 110 gigahertz for most of the things that we're dealing with anyway, you do get a slight negative slope where the decay of the material will change with an increase of frequency. Basically, the decay will go down with an increase of frequency. Then uh, on to the next slide, uh, I'll show um, some testing we did on the exact same panel. And this is just really to show the influences uh, are not related to test method. This is actually raw material influences due to frequency and the dipole moments. So what I did was I used the same sheet of material, 20 mil thick RO4003C, and I tested it in panel form with still copper clad panel as we made it. And I have a test called FSR, full sheet resonance. And I can use that test method to look at different nodes and different frequencies and look at the dielectric constant of the copper clad panel. And I did that at node 1, 0, and 2, 0. And I did see the trend that as I go up in frequency, the dielectric constant did decrease. So that was one data set. And then I sent off the copper clad panel to a fabricator they had the circuits made for me and sent back, and I had two different sets of circuits, uh, actually three. The blue curve is the microstrip transmission lines using our differential length method. And then I also have in there two points, one from a 1 gigahertz ring resonator, another one from a 5 gigahertz ring resonator. And in this case, the resonator showed that as you go up in frequency, indeed the design decay or the decay of the material itself as it's reported by the circuits did decrease. And also, you can see clearly in the blue curve, you have a slight negative slope. So an increase in frequency means a decrease in dielectric constant. So this is really just to show the point that the material dispersion is real, regardless of how you want to test it. So this is three different test methods testing the same sheet of material and getting the same behavior that as you increase frequency, the dielectric constant will decrease. So moving on to the next slide is a screenshot of uh, one of the softwares that we have on our Rogers Technology Support Hub. It's the MWI 2019 software. And I'm showing this because, as I've mentioned, the design decay value is frequency dependent. It's substrate thickness dependent. It's actually circuit design dependent somewhat and copper surface roughness dependent. So uh, how do you get the right numbers for um, the design decay when there's all these different uh, dependencies? Uh, easy way is to really download the software that's free for download. It's a very simple software for impedance modeling and also loss modeling. And embedded in the software is the design DK. So you would select the material that you have interest of and then the copper surface roughness and frequency, and it will tell you what the design DK is that you should use. Now, just as a quick remark on this, material, on this uh, software, the software is actually using closed form equations, so it's very fast, but it does not have the accuracy of a, of a field solving software. So normally what I tell customers to do is to use this software as a ballpark tool or even a screening tool to basically go through some of the basics of uh, determining what material would be appropriate for the application, what thickness, things like that. And then once that's understood and you really want to do the fine, uh, the fine tuning of the design itself, that's when you really should switch over to a more accurate field solving software such as COMSOL. So moving on to the next slide, I wanted to explain the uh, microstrip differential phase length method. And here I'm showing a few pictures. 
Upper right-hand corner is just a sanity check that we all understand microstrip, signal to conduct on top, ground plane on the bottom. And on one panel, I am looking at many different circuits on a panel, and the ones I'm testing for transmission lines are identical in every way except physical length. So I have a short length circuit, long length circuit. They are 50 ohm transmission lines and uh, exactly identical in every way and usually in very close proximity to each other on the panel to minimize any kind of material variation. And then um, what we do is we measure the phase response of the short circuit and the long circuit. And what we measure is S21 unwrapped phase. And we manipulate the microstrip phase response formula to the far right formula to where the delta L is the difference in physical length. Delta phi is the difference in the phase angles that we measured from the short and the long circuit at frequency F. And we get the measured effective dielectric constant. And then what we do is we destroy the circuit and do a microsection, and we get very exact details of the circuit geometry, and we put that into MWI 2019 or a field solver, and then we have the software tell us what it thinks the effective dielectric constant is, and in the software, we keep adjusting the dielectric constant of the material until the software effective dielectric constant matches the measured effective dielectric constant, and the DK value that makes that match, we assume that DK value to be the material at that frequency. And then we increment and we move on to the next frequency and do the calculations all over again. And then on the following slide, it shows you the output of that, which is basically a curve of dielectric constant that's been extracted for the y-axis and the x-axis is frequency. And in this case, it's about as wide band as I can measure, going from about 33 megahertz out to 110 gigahertz. And we like a wide band response to uh, evaluating our materials because these materials are used in many different applications, different frequencies. So it's nice to have a curve that's wide band that shows uh, the dielectric co uh, constant of the material at these different frequencies. Again, in this case, the 5 mole 3003, this is a material that's mostly used in millimeter wave applications. And you can see that it's pretty well uh, behaved for dispersion, have a minimal di design decay change at the millimeter wave frequencies. The next slide is showing insertion loss curves of the same material, 5 mil 3003 with ED copper blue curve and then rolled copper red curve. And I've already showed this data previously, but I wanted to show you the differences that are pretty remarkable at millimeter wave frequencies. So here I'm going up to 110 gigahertz. And you can see around 77 gigahertz or so where this material is used a lot. Uh, there's a pretty significant difference between the circuits with rolled copper and circuits with ED copper. So copper surface roughness definitely matters, as I've mentioned, but especially when you get into the millimeter wave range of frequencies. The next slide is now talking more specifically about granite coplanar waveguide, which is what uh, ComSol did the modeling and demo on. And we made the measurements on the circuits. ComSol did the, uh, the modeling, and their models matched our measured results very nicely. Uh, no issue at all there. Uh, but I just want to explain a little bit more about the ground and coplanar waveguide because I run into a lot of practical situations uh, where that can be um, the real world results sometimes can be confused with uh, the modeling results. And what I mean by that is uh, there are certain aspects of how the ground and coplanar waveguide is sensitive to the circuit fabrication itself. So really what I find is the ground and coplanar waveguide is sensitive to the copper surface roughness, which is, again, at the substrate copper interface. But it's different if it's tightly coupled ground and coplanar waveguide or loosely coupled. And what I mean by that, tightly coupled means there's a tight space or a small space between the ground signal ground on the top copper layer as compared to loosely coupled having a larger space. So if it's tightly coupled, the, uh, the coupling between the ground signal ground on the top uh, coplanar layer means that the current density is much higher on the side walls of these coupled conductors, and that means there's less current density at the copper substrate interface where the rough and copper resides. So that's why a tightly coupled and loosely coupled can see differences of the copper surface roughness. So the next slide is showing three different pictures of the grounded coplanar waveguide. And the top one is just showing, again, tightly coupled. The middle one is the same thing except loosely coupled. And uh, again, the copper surface roughness effects due to the laminate is going to be more noticeable on loosely coupled or on microstrip. Microstrip would have not the extra ground planes on the top copper layer. And that's actually what I've been showing in the last several slides were microstrip. But for ground coplanar waveguide, there are differences due to coupling. 
And then another item that I run into a lot is trapezoidal effects, and that's the bottom picture. And if you do a microsection of the ground and coplanar waveguide, normally what you see is the bottom picture. The conductors are not perfectly rectangular. And a lot of models will assume rectangular uh, conductors. However, I know Comfold does have the ability to put in the trapezoidal shape, so that can be done. But I did want to point out that uh, this trapezoidal shape will cause a little bit of difference as well because what happens is when the conductors are very trapezoidal as compared to rectangular, the effects of the trapezoidal are such that the uh, current density will shift down to be closer to the substrate. So now um, the copper surface roughness will cause uh, a little bit more impact on the uh, insertion loss and the phase response. So next slide is uh, really a conclusion and just introducing our Rogers Technology Support Hub and inviting you to become a member. And on our Rogers Technology Support Hub, we have a variety of different things. We have uh, different calculators that are relatively simple, but they are calculators for impedance and loss modeling. Some of them are thermal calculators for like CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion. Some are also related to thermal uh, coefficient of dielectric constant how much the dielectric constant changes with temperature. We also have Raj mobile apps. We have technical papers from a variety of different uh, papers that we, that we present at uh, different trade shows in the industry. We have a pretty large video library now, and we also have an area where you can contact the engineer in your region. So that's all I have, and I think we have a few more minutes for questions. Uh, June and John, I want, uh, this is Cliff uh, on the line. I want to thank you uh, for a very comprehensive, interesting, and informative presentation. We do have some time for questions. There are quite a few, so let's see if we can step through them as quickly as possible. And again, I invite our viewers to type them into the Q&A box if you have any further questions. We'll answer as many as we can. I'll start with this. Uh, can you tell me again the difference between the transition boundary condition and the impedance boundary condition? Yes, uh, this is G. Yoon, and it was briefly mentioned, so, uh, but let me repeat again. So both of them are, are used to address the lossy metallic boundary. So one for the geometrically very thin, highly conductive, and electrically much thicker than skin depth. And the other is for the geometrically very thin and conductive lossy layer. So, for instance, if you want to address the load on your SMA connector, use the impedance boundary condition. And if you want to deal with a thin copper layer on your circuit board, the transition boundary condition is appropriate. Okay, and another question regarding the modeling. Uh, can I modify the material properties loaded from your library? Oh, yes. Um, so there are many predefined material properties, including the Rogers Corporation's PCB board material. Even after you um, load into your model builder, all of these properties can be edited. And it's not only just a um, single value, it can be replaced by user-defined variables and functions and parameters. So for instance, the material, material properties um, they are um, a function of the temperature or frequency. Can I create my own parts? Oh, well, of course. And, and our module provides this part library, and you saw the bunch of predefined geometries. But if you have your own part um, um, repeatedly used in your model, you build it and load it to your model. Easy. Can COMSOL simulate antennas? So, so though it was a part of the circuit simulation, so certain type of people are still interested in antenna simulation. So I didn't introduce the application library. Still, you can access through the software, and you will see almost 100 examples with step-by-step -step instruction. Among them, about 30 examples, tutorial examples, they are antennas. So you will see many different types of antenna, dipole, or printed microstrip patch, arrays, monopole, spiral, and um, spiral float antenna, or helix antenna. Yeah, please check the application library and application gallery. OK, I believe this one may be for John. For the design DK, did you look at using an effective length 
due to surface roughness instead of altering the decay to get a phase match? Yeah, early on, uh, some time ago, we did experiments. Actually, this microstrip differential phase length method we've been working on for about 10 years, and over time, we've really looked at a, a quite a variety of different things, and that's really how we ended up with the, um, the test method the way it's defined now. And actually, if anyone's interested, I have a lot more details on the test method itself. But at this point, we're really looking at uh, the ST1 phase angle, the short circuit, and the long circuit, and from that, extracting the effective dielectric constant, and then later getting the uh, extracted DK from the basic calculations I showed. But in reality, there's a lot more going on because we also have to account for transmission line dispersion of the microstrip. There's uh, also um, some amount of effective width of the conductor where fringing fields come into play. So. It's not quite as straightforward as I showed here, but uh, we have looked at a variety of different things and also length ratios and other things. And we really determined just over the years of compared a lot of results uh, here with a lot of our OEMs as well, uh, that our test method, the way it's defined right now, seems to be uh, the one that makes the most sense. Okay, next question. What is the difference between the standard ED and VLP ED? Yeah, those terms are actually uh, terms that are generated by IPC, and uh, there's a range of roughness that will de that will define that. So VLP uh, copper roughness is in a range uh, of numbers that I don't remember to be honest. But basically, VLP is very low profile, and just the standard ED without any kind of mention of the profile is a little bit higher. And if I were just to give you some ballpark numbers from what I see, the standard ED that I see normally has a roughness around 2.2 microns RMS, and a very low profile is usually around uh, 1 to 1.2 or someplace in that range. It can vary depending on the manufacturer of the copper. Okay, next question. Uh, how did you extract uh, the insertion loss from the differential length method? Oh, actually, that's the easy part. Uh, so whenever I'm doing the measurements of the short length circuit, long length circuit, uh, all I do is I measure S21 magnitude, and I subtract simply the long, the, the short circuit from the long circuit at S21 magnitude. And uh, if everything is truly the same, and I use the exact same connectors, which I do, I don't solder the connectors, so these are uh, connectors that are just pressure connected uh, to the circuit, and I can use the exact same physical net connectors on the long circuit and the short circuit. So in theory, when I subtract these, uh, the losses of the long and the short circuit, I'm subtracting out the effect of the connectors and the signal launch. And I say in theory, and I think that's correct whenever you have very good return loss, but when the return loss is a little questionable, then it gets a little funny. But basically, it's just a subtraction of losses from the long circuit and the short circuit. Okay. Uh, this is another question for you, John. Uh, does the copper roughness affect the impedance of the transmission line as well, or just phase velocity? It actually does, actually. So we've done some tests there, too. And uh, being that impedance, if you do some simple impedance models, you'll find that for a microstrip, the most uh, significant variables are the substrate thickness is uh, the big variable, conductor width is another one, copper thickness is another, and then finally, DK itself. So how the DK is altered by the copper surface roughness does have an impact, but it's not as impactful as, let's say, the conductor width or even the substrate thickness variation. But it is, it is there. It's definitely noticeable. Okay. What is your explanation for why the wave is slowed down by the copper surface roughness? Is it because of the higher DK? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again, please. The question is, uh, what is your explanation for why the wave is slowed down by the copper surface roughness? Is it because of the higher DK? Well, actually, we've looked at this a lot, too, and we've got several papers if someone's interested. And uh, what we found was if we compare very smooth copper to very rough copper on substrates that have a low DK or a high DK, the DK of the substrate itself just doesn't matter. It's uh, it really the phase velocity is being impacted by the copper surface roughness itself. And in a very simple sense, and I don't have the physics behind me when it comes to wave propagating on different mediums like this, but I always had the impression that you have a longer wave path with a rough copper than a smooth copper. So basically, the propagation point to point is going to be slower when you have a rougher copper and a longer path, so to speak. Okay. 
Next question. Is there a relation between copper surface roughness and insertion loss dips, suck outs at high, which are suck outs at higher frequencies? No, that's a good question, though, because I've suspected that at one time, and so far I have not been able to prove that. So when I've seen these different suck outs that happen at high frequency, my experience anyway, has been due to resonances of uh, unwanted resonances of the circuit or the connector or the transition. And for most of my work at millimeter wave, I've had a, a heck of a lot of work on the uh, signal launcher, basically the transition from the coaxial to the circuit. And that transition at millimeter wave is really critical. And that's where I've had a lot of problems with these suck outs. But as for actually copper surface roughness, and again, we've done things with rough and smooth copper and looking at uh, different circuits and different designs, and the suckouts do not seem to be related to the surface roughness of the copper itself. Okay. I, I have one more question, then we'll have to end it. I think this one may be for Jihoon. What's the basis of your surface roughness model? Is it Hammerstein Jensen or Horai Snowball? Oh, yeah, it was addressed during the live demo, but let me repeat again that both um, Hammerstadt and Janssen's uh, Soltus model and Hooray Snowball models are available in the simulation software. And in the simulation, uh, I used uh, this Hammerstadt and Janssen model. Okay. All right, at this point, I'm going to have to, uh, we've run out of time for questions, uh, and I'll have to end the presentation. I would uh, I would like to thank Gion Mun and uh, John Coonrod for their very complete, uh, comprehensive, informative, informative, and very interesting presentation on high-performance PCB laminates and modeling for microwave and millimeter wave applications. And we appreciate ComSol and Rogers for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, let me leave you with a reminder that the webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch in about an hour. You'll find it in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. Uh, from the home page, click on events, then webinars, and you'll see a link to the archives of, uh, at the top of the page. If your colleagues would benefit from watching this presentation, please let them know. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.